shortwave or ham DXing? No. Broadcast radio DXing. It's out there. And we'll talk a little bit about uh, alternative power for your shack. Stay tuned. This is Jeffrey, AD7LN. Welcome back to the radio room. Welcome back, guys, to the radio room. This is Jeffrey, Alpha Delta 7, Lima, November. And we're going to be talking about uh, broadcast DXing. Your standard radios, such as what's in your car, uh, your clock radio beside your bed, your home stereo, there are many people that make this a hobby where they will tune around, whether it's a just a regular little, little AM FM radio that's in their kitchen or maybe the clock radio that's beside their bed um, AM FM car stereos in their vehicle tune around during the daytime on AM you know, you'll basically hear AM stations, you know, up to 200 miles away. There are always variables involved. But at night on AM, medium wave, which is 530 to 1710, uh, you can hear as far as 1200 miles away, maybe even further. And these folks do this as a hobby. They listen in at night on medium wave, tune around, log what they hear, and try to get a good receive of a signal as far away as they possibly can. And they, they call it medium wave DXing. I don't know if you've ever tried it or not, but at night, tune, up, tune in on a regular AM radio uh, and tune around slowly. You will find more signals than what is normally heard locally in your area. I myself have tuned around at various times around here in the Oregon area and I've heard one instance where a station that was on 660 kilohertz was booming in on a portable AM FM radio that I had. And it was the KTNN Window Rock station in Arizona. Uh, very interesting to listen to. It's, I believe it was the, uh, they were playing Navajo. Native American uh, Navajo music. Another station that I tune into quite frequently here in Oregon is a station that's uh, up in Calgary, Alberta, Canada. It's CKMX. It's a comedy station where they play stand-up comedy 24-7. And that's on 1060 kilohertz. Some nights it's kind of wavery. Of course, there's variables. Mother Nature, the Earth, 
solar conditions, everything applies with radio. So some days or some nights are good, some nights aren't so good. There might be too much uh, of Earth's noise coming in, interfering with the signal, and sometimes the signal just isn't amplified enough to make it this far. Nowadays, people are finding it easier for them to do this medium wave DXing hobby with what you call a uh, SDR radio, software defined receiver, where it's plugged into a computer and the computer does most of the uh, processing of the signal. The unit still requires an antenna, an external antenna plugged into the SDR unit. However, uh, there's many things you can do with a SDR radio that you can't with a standard uh, radio in your vehicle or the clock radio beside your bed. And another neat thing about it is that you can record the signals that are coming in and you can set it up so that it will record if it receives something on the frequency that you're monitoring. So you can walk away from the computer, come back uh, the next morning and see what your computer has caught. And there's the FM DX. This medium wave is normally at night for long distance receive. However, for FM DX, you want to do that in the daytime. And everything applies for those that are schooled in radio, such as amateur radio operators, everything applies for those frequencies on how the frequency travels around the earth, day or night, the uh, ionospheric layers, how it affects the radio signal, uh, 88 to 108 megahertz for FM, same thing applies for uh, this as it would for VHF ham frequencies. Uh, tropospheric ducting affects it greatly. The E layer, uh, such as, uh, you know, sporadic E, um, higher sunspot activities, increases the chances of hearing long distance radio on FM. Now FM, during the, during the night, is normally about uh, oh, 80 miles, 100 miles max. There's always variables depending on how high the, the transmitter antenna is and flat land and any obstacles, what have you. But during the day, if it's tropospheric ducting or sporadic E, it could be uh, all the way up to 1800, 1800 miles, 2000 miles. If you live along the uh, Earth's equator, there's trans-equatorial uh, propagation. That instance, you could hear a signal up to 5000 miles away, depending on the transmitter being within the trans-equatorial line and you also being within that line 5000 miles away. Uh, with high, high sunspot activity, uh, 88 to 108 megahertz, signals bounce off the F layer, the F2 layer, and uh, once again, software defined radio makes this hobby more gratifying for those that are doing it because they can record and get the best signal that they can on a computer and replay it later. Also they can add another software program to it and if that particular station that they're receiving 
many miles away has any kind of uh, uh, RBDS or RDS system where it transmits a silent coded uh, text through the audio. That program that you have will decode any RBDS or RDS uh, setup where you'll most likely see the radio station's call sign and any pertinent information that they see fit to transmit. Uh, but yeah, there's always variables still. Even though most of your FMDX will be done during the daytime on uh, FMDX 108 to 108 or 88 to 108, Mother Nature has its hand in things so you never know you could hear something at night many many miles away. Same applies for the medium wave DX. Most DX is at night for medium wave, but Mother Nature can always throw you for a loop. Um, you never know what's going to be out there until you tune around and look for it. Uh, as far as receiving these two uh, bands, those that are f mostly into medium wave DXing, they'll start off most likely with a, a loop. Let me see if I've got one here. Here's a basic loop and you can either use this inductively or conductively. Inductively really for me seems to work just as good as conductively. And this is a purchased model that's been made by uh, a company here, Grundig. You just set this next to an AM receiver and tune till you hear the uh, received signal go up in volume and clarity. Some people will make a loop much larger than this, thus amplifying the signal fully and more than what this can provide. Uh, for those that have uh, large receivers, they may install a, an outdoor antenna, maybe an outdoor loop or even a long wire uh, for more receive. Uh, FMDXing, most of those people that have uh, an in-depth uh, how can I say this? FMDXers will normally have a large uh, receiver of some kind that's very sensitive or an SDR and they will have an outdoor antenna. So in the event that uh, a sporadic E or whatever affects that FM signal hundreds of miles away, that outdoor antenna that person has will receive the signal much clearer and cleaner than you would in your house with a uh, telescopic antenna on a small portable. Also, gray line. Gray line definitely is something that affects both and you will see early in the morning sunrise or sunset at night that you will find long distance signals sometimes surprisingly well during gray line. So with that let's go to our alternative uh, energy sources such as solar, batteries, and being prepared just a little bit. Amateur radio operators should already have this down. But let's get into it a little bit. Coming up. Okay, so every radio hobbyist, amateur, shortwave operator, uh, those that are into prepping, uh, just people in general that have a lot of uh, bad weather conditions in, the, in their living area. You should always have some sort of basic 
power backup, even if it's just a temporary setup, uh, a low power setup, just so that you can have power for maybe charging a telephone, you know, a cell phone, or powering a radio so that you can hear the local news that's going on in your area from a local broadcast or a, a broadcast from a town outside of your town that does have power. Uh, here's some other instances to have uh, some battery backup and some alternative power. Field days, de-expeditions, ham radio related, mobile applications in a vehicle and or in an RV, POTA, camping, emergencies of any kind, and then of course your power loss during weather events, which happens a lot here in Oregon, Washington. Uh, and the further north you go, the more it happens. In these events, it's always good to at least have a minimal amount of some kind of backup. And a really good source of this backup would be some sort of solar panel, a small battery to store the energy that the solar panel prese presents to the battery. Uh, and that panel can recharge the battery daily depending on how many days you are without power. Or if you're not going to be in a place with power to begin with, if you're going on a field day or de-expedition. And in these events, depending if it's home, if it's a vehicle, or just out in the field, you may have a want for a different setup, at least to some degree. Of course, if you're at home, you can go with a larger solar panel or panels because they are heavy. You could have a multitude of panels set up outside somewhere pointing towards the, uh, the sun as the sun comes across. On a vehicle, it's going to be a little more iffy. If it's a van or a RV, you can permanently install the panels on the roof. If it's going to be a car or a truck, you may want to just have the panel loose and have it set up against the vehicle or make some sort of arrangement so that it can be temporarily attached to the vehicle while you're parked. In the field, you're definitely going to want something that's lightweight and portable. If you're going to be trekking by foot or bicycle or motorcycle, whatever, boat, you need something portable and lightweight because you're going to be on the move. Uh, and there are many panels by different manufacturers that can accommodate for that setup. Just checking the battery here. So, uh, solar panels, starting off with them. There are basically three different kinds of solar panels out on the market right now. There's the monocrystalline, the polycrystalline, and the amorphous. And the monocrystalline are the uh, the better of the the two between mo mono poly mono and poly monocrystallines uh, the the panel is a bit more brittle but it is more efficient uh, they are smaller if you were to have a hundred watt mono and a hundred watt poly you'd find that the poly would have to be much larger. Say this is a 100 watt and that's a 100 watt. 
the mono would be smaller to, in producing 100 watts versus the poly would have to be much bigger to produce that same 100 watts. Uh, polycrystalline is just that. It has many crystallines in the solar cells. And they're, the polys are bulkier, heavier, a larger for the same wattage. Uh, monocrystallines, yeah, you're probably going to pay a little more, but they're more efficient and smaller. And then there's the uh, the amorphous, which are more more of a film type, very thin, very lightweight. Some are very flexible. You may have seen some on the market that can fold up or bend. Those are the amorphous. Uh, they also can handle higher heat, which is another nice thing. The amorphous, because they handle higher heat, are more efficient during that point when they get hot sitting in the sun. Where a monocrystalline and polycrystalline, once they get hot, they start to lose their efficiency a little bit. Not a lot, but some. Also, uh, the amorphous panels, the flexible thin panels, can handle shade. Shade is a big thing against solar panels. In the event that a solar panel, let's say, let's say there's this part right here just gets shaded. A tree or something is shading over this spot right here. A tree limb or something. If this was a mono or a, po a, mono or a poly, because this, even this small part of the panel is shaded, it reduces the output of that solar panel sometimes more than 50%, just because of that small spot being shaded. Whereas an amorphous, if this was an amorphous panel, it doesn't affect it as much. Uh, yes, you will see a, a decrease in output if that amount is uh, shaded with an amorphous, but it won't be 50%. It will be less than that. So there, there are some uh, there are some good things with the amorphous. They are a little spendy though, but really if you're going to be going out in the field or doing a de-expedition where you're going to be out in the middle of nowhere, you're going to want something lightweight, flexible, that can handle a little bit of shade once in a while depending on where it's sitting, or if uh, the cloud cover is pretty heavy, that amorphous is still going to be working for you. And as far as setting up, let's just say you've got a panel here. Here's your solar panel. And you want to charge a battery. Now the battery can be any kind of 12 volt battery, deep cycle marine, or you could have two 6 volt deep cycle marines that equal 12 volts when put together. You could just have a standard 12 volt lead acid. You could go with the, uh, the lithium ions or the lithium iron. Uh, lithium iron phosphates. Anyway, let's see, here's a, get this going here for you. Let's just say that this is, there's the positive of the battery right there. So, you don't just connect a solar panel directly to a battery many reasons. Unless, of course, the solar panel is very small, smaller than 15 watt output. That's another thing too. Solar panels are rated by wattage output and amperage. Of course, batteries are also voltage and amperage. If the solar panel is less than 15 watts output, you can directly connect 
positive, positive, negative, ne negative, and charge up that battery. It'll take a long time, even in the sun, uh, direct sun, if it's 15 watts, because the 15 watt panel is very small, produces very little output. However, let's say you've got a 100 watt solar panel. A portable one that looks kind of like a briefcase that opens up for your uh, portable field day stuff. Connecting a 100 watt solar panel directly to a battery is going to cook that battery no matter what kind it is. If it's a lead acid or a sealed reason, you know, if it's a sealed lead acid or lithium iron phosphate or whatever, it doesn't matter because there's a problem there that under sunlight, solar panels don't produce just 12 or 13 volts. They're anywhere from 18 to 20 volts DC under an open situation, no load. So in this event, you need a charge controller. And what this charge controller does is it regulates the amount of voltage coming from the solar panel and putting it into the battery. So it's, you know, let's go like this, positive into here, positive into here. and then negative to here. And that's going to be uh, an output of 12.8 to 13 and a half volts to the battery, which what it requires. From the 18 to 20 volts that the solar panel produces under full sunlight. That's the reason for the charge controller. There's two different kinds of charge controllers out there. There's the PWM, pulse width modulation, and there's the MPPT charge controller, which is the max power point tracking charge controller. PWMs are less expensive, uh, and they're good for basically one or maybe two panels together tied into the PWM before it goes to a battery such as a lead acid or a couple of deep cycle six volts tied together for 12 or something to that degree. But if you're gonna use it on a, uh, on the newfangled batteries that are popular right now, the lithium iron phosphate batteries that are 12 volts you're going to run around you're going to want to run an MPPT so that it charges the LiPo 4 batteries properly these are uh, tricky batteries as far as to recharge but they're great batteries because they're lightweight they're small easy for portability and they have a tremendous amount of recharge cycles some are up to two hundred, or excuse me, two thousand to three thousand recharge cycles. And they can last, uh, you know, anywhere between ten and fifteen years. That's why they're so popular, because they can be used over and over and over and over again. But you have to have a proper charge setup to to give it a full charge. So you need an MPPT charger or charge controller to charge one of these batteries. And also, if you want to use a regular wall charger, you can buy those for LiPo 4 batteries, but they have to be specific to LiPo 4 batteries. LiPo 4 batteries do not require a float charge or a maintain charge. Once they're charged, that's it. You unplug it from the battery or the charger. Um, that's just how these batteries are. 
Great batteries though. And they're relatively inexpensive. You can find them online. Uh, plentiful and cheap. And also, before we get out of the charge controller setups, if you want to know what size charge controller you need, because it has to be set so that the amperage it, it can handle is higher than the amperage that the solar panel provides under full light. So a really easy way to do that, say it's a 100 watt panel right there, you would divide 100 watts by the volts that it produces under full light. Let's, so that's what, 18 volts? or Yeah, let's try 18. And that will produce the amount of amps that this panel will make. And that should be five and a half. So this charge controller must be larger than say six six amps uh, rated for six amps or better. I think the smallest ones I've seen are seven or eight and that's the PWM cheap ones. But again if you're going to run a LifePo 4 battery you need to run one of these MPPTs and if you're running 100 water then you need you know proper amperage MPPT charge controller. So, I think that's a pretty good start uh, to get you rolling in the right direction. So if there's anything else you guys want me to dive into as far as solar or charge controllers or batteries, uh, let me know and I can make another little segment about something else. Uh, let me know in the comments. And we'll go from there. So you guys take care. Thanks for stopping by at uh, another Elmer time. And uh, I'll catch you later. Have a great one. Alpha Delta 7, Lima, November. And I'm clear. Bye-bye.